So, so thank you very much for your invitation. And uh, I, I liked the invitation was kind of interesting. You know, I started this uh, in this field uh, in the, the mid 1980s. And it's kind of amazing to see how, how much it's grown in the many decades since we've done that. And that's really exciting and great. Um, I want to talk today about benchmarking a complex quantum processor. And uh, what's happened in the last few years is people have taken the basic technology people have been working on for many decades now and been able to put together the qubits and the measurement systems and the control systems to build you know, real quantum computers. Maybe, maybe a little bit prototype at this point, but you know, they, they are for real when they're doing calculations. And as we build these systems, there's a big question of how we're going to test them. And we can clearly test them with algorithms and the complexity algorithms, and that's great. But what I wanna to talk today about is a careful test with um, a cross entropy benchmarking to check how well the quantum computer is work, working. And in particular, we're interested in knowing uh, that, excuse me a second, uh, we're knowing that uh, uh, when we run the quantum computer on these huge Hubert spaces with many qubits, uh, what's the error gonna be like for the whole system? And the good news of this in the experiment we're gonna talk about today that people probably read about is we've been able to validate the fidelity starting from one and two qubit error measurements all the way up to a very large system running a fairly deep algorithm. And what we find, and this is good news, that there are no additional decoherence physics when we scale that. And that actually is, is good, it's good news for that. And it means that you know, we can forge ahead and try to build a better and better quantum computers. And I wanna to talk today about the experiment that did that test and some kind of the background material, because I think it's very important as we build these complex systems to go ahead and benchmark them and to try to understand that they're working properly. And of course, we wanna know that and there are any practical problems or any fundamental problems that we might see. And that's what the, this experiment uh, really is all about in my mind. That's one of the big reasons I wanted to do that. Just as a first slide for the introduction to the whole session, we make these macroscopic quantum systems that are more or less fraction of a millimeter, millimeter size of electrical systems where the currents and voltages uh, are, are quantized uh, in, in the, coming from a macroscopic number of electrons in the system. So here's a picture of a continuous ground plane with a cross cut in the center. The dark brown is the insulation that forms a capacitor. And then the junctions at the bottom form an inductor, a nonlinear inductor. And we actually use two junctions. So as we put current into here and put flux in the loop, we can change the inductance and then change the resonant frequency. This system is mapped to a pendulum, so it's nonlinear. Uh, and then you can look at the quantum mechanics of that. And semi-classically, the zero state is in the ground state. Uh, uh, and then the one state has one photon, microwave photon excitation. And because this is nonlinear, the one to two transition is about 200 megahertz difference, so we can just stay in the zero and one state. And you can write it schematically or kind of simply like this. You can talk about the wave functions of the device. It kind of looked like photon states uh, uh, and easy to describe. Uh, here's the chip that we're using, the Sycamore processor for this experiment, 54 qubits. The gray crosses are the qubits, and the blue boxes are adjustable couplers that connect the qubits in a two-dimensional nearest neighbor grid. And I want to point out very importantly that this grid was chosen to be forward compatible to do surface code error correction. And in, in fact, the Google group has published some a recent paper on doing that, some, some aspects of it 
uh, surf, uh, surface code error correction. And I want to say that if you want to do error correction well and to have exponentially small errors, you need four connections to each of the qubits, which of course we naturally have here. If these are adjustable couplers, so it's really great that they have low off errors and it could be made very fast. Of course, the minus is you have to have more control wires uh, to do that, but okay, uh, that's the design trade-off we've done. And I think it actually helps build better uh, qubits to have the little bit more complexity. Uh, this fabricated chip is put in, in this mount here. It's a circuit board with microwave connectors around the outside with some kind of magnetic shielding. And then it's put inside of a dilution refrigerator right here that goes to uh, about 10, 20 millikelvin, which is much, much less than H bar omega of about 200 millikelvin of the, the photon energy. And thus you can get rid of thermal effects. And then you have a whole lot of wires uh, connecting this to control it, as well as low temperature preamps to do the quantum limited measurement. And then all these wires go up to the top of the cryostat and to rack mount electronics that we've been developing for quite a year, quite a while now, custom built high speed, high precision uh, that allows you to control the qubits. And of course, there's a tremendous amount of software lying behind this to get all this to work and all, all this to work as automatically as possible as you would imagine when you make something this complex. Let me talk here first about, you know, how this device is working with the adjustable couplers. And we have a schematic on the right here where we have a differential transmon qubit with the line coming in that puts flux in that can change the qubit frequency. We read out in the standard way. But what's new here is the adjustable coupler that goes between them that is just another transmon device, in this case, single-ended, that's at a higher frequency than the qubits. And that coupler can adjust its frequency with this external line here. And what happens is, is we have a, a excitation in here, it drives the center uh, device off resonance, and you then get a virtual coupling of that off resonant excitation then driving the qubit. And since uh, the qubit drive is lower than the, the transmon frequency, this has an inductive kind of response and the net coupling effect from left to right looks like a negative capacitance whose value can be changed according to how close the, the coupler frequency is to the qubit. So the closer it is, the higher the coupling that you get. So it gives you an adjustable coupler. You'd like to zero it. And to be able to zero that, you put a fixed cap coupling capacitor between the two so that some particular bias the negative capacitance plus the positive capacitance is zero, and then you won't get any coupling at all. And that's really convenient when you're trying to do this to have a hard zero here. So in order to understand that, you do a simple experiment, swap experiment, where you put an, a, a not gate, a photon, into one of the qubits. You then bring the qubits on resonance, you turn on the coupler, uh, for a certain amount of time, and then you turn that off again and then measure if it's in the other uh, qubit. And that kind of measures the swapping. So here's the population transfer from Q0 to Q1 in blue versus coupler bias here and the on time and the, in the vertical axis. And what you see at zero coupler bias, you see the oscillation going from Q0 to Q1 to Q0 and Q1. By the way, this is real data here. The, the present qubits really operate quite well. And then as you turn on the coupler bias, these two capacitances start uh, um, uh, canceling each other out. And if you get a certain bias here, it's just all white. And that's where there's no population transfer at all. And then you, you go a little bit farther than that, you start turning on strong coupling and you can get very fast oscillations if you want. So the coupler bias is off at some particular bias, you have to calibrate, and then we put in the on condition at either even higher uh, coupler bias. And from that, we can uh, make our coupling gates and tangling gates from these kind of basic swap operation, which we've been learning to do for many years now. Um, so with that in mind, let me talk next 
about how we're going to actually measure how well our gates and, and the like are doing. And this started off, let's say we were doing 10, 12 years ago, something like that, using tomography, where you look at a single gate and then you measure what happens and you can quantify that very well. Of course, as many people have pointed out, uh, that is not good because the state preparation and measurement errors are high enough. It's hard to know exactly what the gate's doing. And then what people have been doing for many years is doing randomized benchmarking where we have single qubit gates and two qubit gates, for example, cycling many times. And then uh, you get dominated by the many cycles of the error. Uh, and uh, you can kind of subtract away what happens with the state preparation and measurement. Now, randomized benchmarking is great, but I would say there's, there's some problem, not really problems, but there might be a better way to do that. And the problem with randomized benchmarking is when you do the bunch of randomized benchmarking sequence, you kind of have to invert the sequence at the end, which gives you a little bit complication in doing that. But more, more profoundly is the, the Clifford gates that you're typically doing with the randomized benchmarking is not really the exact physical gate you're, you're making. Uh, the any gate that you make, this is an analog computing system, it's going to be different than a Clifford gate, even by a small amount. And what you really want to know is what is the gate that you're actually making and how good is that gate making and being made. And cross-entropy benchmarking allows you to both calibrate and validate any arbitrary gate. Okay, so let me kind of explain how that goes. First of all, you start with basic calibrations, which could be tomography or other simple things to get what is a unitary, in this case, of a two qubit gate. Okay, and you can you write that write down, you know, what you think or what you're aiming for that unitary. unitary. And then what you do is you just uh, operate those unitary in many cycles that can vary from one to M or one or all the way up to a large number. And then you put random uh, single qubit gates on, on top of that. And uh, uh, since these are random gates and a fixed unitary here, you're generating uh, uh, complex states at the end. But it turns out that you can use those states that you measure to figure out what, what gate you're actually making. So you, you do this, you get a bunch of measurements here from your quantum computer. And then what you do is you take this, knowing your U of theta and phi and your single qubit gates, and you calculate what those measurement probabilities uh, should be. And then you take these two results and you do a cross entropy fidelity where the take, you take the states that you measure and then you, you, uh, you compute or you take from a lookup table what the probability is from the classical computer simulation and then you multiply by two to the n minus one, and that gives you a fidelity. And what happens is, is given a, a true system fidelity, what you uh, can then do is, is measure, measure that cross entropy, measure the error, but do a class of computer optimization where you vary slightly the parameters of your two qubit gate to get the highest fidelity, or if you like, the highest fit of your unitary to whatever you're measuring. So you do that in classical computer and software, and then you get a improved knowledge of what U and theta and phi is. So as an example here, this is the cross entropy benchmarking fidelity versus the number of cycles M here. And as expected, this goes down exponentially with the large number of cycles. If you start with the original U, it's about a 1% error. And then if you do the XEB optimized and fit to this, uh, you get about a factor of two better, okay? Now in the end, this U of theta and phi might not be the gate you want, but since you understand how you're making the gate, you can fiddle with the parameters of the physical gate to get U of theta and phi to the, the, the gate you want, and then run through this again and check it. So you can in fact converge onto any gate you want. The other nice thing about cross uh, uh, benchmarking is that you can actually get purity information. So the easy way to think about it is if you think about a single qubit, 
uh, cross entropy benchmarking tells you how close the final block vector is to, let's say, the zero state that you, you want. But in purity error, it tells you the length of the block vector. So it tells you how much decoherence. And for example, when you do the purity error, it agrees to tomography and the purity error is lower than what you get with the XEB error, which tells you in this particular case, you're mostly limited by uh, decoherence, uh, but a little bit from your gate error. And that's of course useful to know, okay? So the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, low error uh, with fast, uh, uh, you know, low error of the device. And what you do is you take the device, you look at individual devices, measure the fidelity, histogram them. This is a integrated histogram. And then in the, the uh, skinny dotted lines, you see kind of a Gaussian distribution with a mean of about 0.15%. But what you, that's not how you're running the quantum computer. You're running the quantum computer where all the gates are happening simultaneously. So you do that experiment with all the controlled couplers off and you get the black line. And it's a little bit worse. You expect some crosstalk and the like, but it's not that much worse. You do the same process with two qubit errors. Uh, the, the basic qubit errors are a little bit more than a factor of two of the single qubit errors which is what you expect. However, when you do them simultaneously, it degrades a little bit and uh, that's to be maybe expected. And of course, that's something you have to work on and you can do the same thing for average. So the point I wanna make here is you need to quote all your qubits, what they're doing. You need to know what's going on by themselves and also what happens when you do them all at once and when you're gonna use a quantum computer. So oh, just here, you can make arbitrary gates here of, uh, of the particular form here in the way that I talked about previously. And all these gates can have low errors uh, in, as shown in that experiment. So in the experiment where we're testing the 53 qubits of the big device, what we're doing is running basically a general purpose algorithm where we interleave single qubit gates with two qubit gates and of course the two qubit gates go around to the four nearest neighbors of each gate. So you can see the whole array here. If you look at the centerpiece right here, you see the single qubit gates and then the, the two qubit gates that are very as you, you do that in time. And then here we're doing 90, re, re, no, 90 degree rotations for the single qubit gates along the X axis or the Y axis or the axis in between at 45 degrees those constitute the random gates. And then we want to calibrate what the, the, the fixed gates are or test them here. Uh, single qubit gates are about 25 nanoseconds. The two qubit gates turned out to be faster, about 12 nanoseconds. Uh, so, uh, so that's good. You're not losing too much coherence from that. And then we use this uh, cross entropy benchmarking where we check this random circuit here we take a bunch of measurements with the quantum computer. Those gives us the output vectors Xs. We then do a calculation on a big data center or summit, big supercomputer. We get the probabilities of all the states. And then we do the cross entry fidelity where we take our measurements and then plug in the probability. If everything's uncorrelated, that probability is one over two to the N and fidelity is zero. If it's perfect, no errors, the fidelity turns out to be one. And what's really nice is this fidelity in the end tells you how if you have one error or not. So the fidelity is a measurement of what fraction of the runs you ran the algorithm with no bit flip or no face flip errors. And in, in fact, like I said before, that's system validation and you learn the control map. So here's the data from taking this. Uh, this is starts out here at 12 qubits. That's about 250 gates total. And the full circuit cross entropy fidelity is given here about 40%. So a good fraction of the time it works. And of course, as we increase the number of qubits, the chances of errors go down. And by the time we get here to 53 qubits, it's a little bit under 1% or so. And that's to be expected, okay? And initially it's a laptop doing the calculation, then a workstation, 
And then finally, at the last data point, that's maybe a big data center for many, many hours. But OK, you can do it. It turns out you can simplify this circuit and say, cut the two qubit gates in the middle of the circuit. We call that patch. And now solving the quantum mechanics for the two independent patches is a lot simpler. Uh, more of them gates are more or less the same. So when you do that, you get more or less the same fidelity, kind of as you expect. You can do something in between with the lighted having a few gates left and with some mathematical uh, tricks to the testing, you can, you can uh, get that data too. And then you can go from this particular pattern of the neighboring qubits to this particular pattern. This pattern, there's a mathematical simplification. This is not, in this case, it's too hard to calculate and to check your quantum computer, but you can go to the patch and alight it. And since it's worked out over here, you, uh, you expect the full circuit is going to be along these things here. And again, it's significantly, statistically significant than zero. It's working some fraction of time. Okay, so this is working, it works great, but this is what's really important for this talk. The black line, which is running through all the data, is the prediction from the one and two qubit gates and the measurement errors. And we take that prediction and just compute what we should have gotten in this way more complex experiment it pretty well predicts that. And that's the statement that, uh, you know, the, the, the quantum mechanics and everything, the, the experimental system is working properly. So just kind of to review that, we have the same fidelity, full alighted patch predicted, uh, depending on the complexity we're doing, the errors do not depend on the degree of entanglement and computational complexity. Now, of course, we assume that when we think about errors and how a quantum computer works, it's very nice to check that. And that, of course, is very good for the future that things are working properly. The prediction is basically comes from essentially high school statistics, where we take the product of one minus the error of each gate in the system. And it's just some kind of a classical, there's no coherence in this at all which is kind of surprising given it's a, uh, maybe a quantum system, but that's what you expect if things are, are working well. And this kind of assumption is of course what is made when you want to do error correction or more complex uh, experiments. So it's good to see that that works. And then quantum mechanics works at this huge two to the 53 or 10 to the 16 Hilbert space. Uh, this is way more testing than what's been done before. So again, that's good. And finally, I would say that this particular cross entropy benchmarking can actually give you information about what's going on internally with these algorithms, which have a couple hundred gates in it. So, for example, this is, I think it's for 14, 16 qubits, cross entropy of benchmarking fidelity, where for one of the qubits and one of the time slices out of the four or 500 that are there, we take this classical simulation and we put a, a Z gate with a, a phase theta in it. And when we have a, a theta of pi, that's a phase flip error, the cross entropy benchmarking goes to zero, as I told you previously. If you do a variable amount of theta, a continuous amount of theta, you get the orange dots. And that is matched by the cosine squared behavior which you think about in terms of a digitized error of that particular error mechanism. And it's kind of interesting. It shows that the digitized errors work even when you're in the middle of the, the whole algorithm. And in fact, if you look carefully here, the, the orange circles are a little bit to the right. And it's basically saying that internally, what we think is the optimal gate for that uh, particular qubit and time slice is a little bit different and this could tell you, in fact, what's going on internally. You can look for course of correlations. And there, there's a possibility with cross-entropy benchmarking to get this more information. Why no additional errors? We've worked for many years, hardware to make a low crosstalk design. The XEB algorithm uses basically random knot gates. So you're doing some kind of spin echoing and dynamic decoupling that decorrelates noise, especially one over F drift. 
and, uh, um, and the like. And this kind of echoing can be used for a general purpose algorithm called gauge transformation and randomized compiling. Uh, for those cases where you can't use that and the Google processor has done that, uh, you can calibrate very, very carefully to get good errors, but that requires more work. Uh, I just as I'm running out of time here, um, let me just say that the, the Google group has run this processor and smaller versions of it on various problems. Uh, hartree fock chemistry, adiabatic optimization, Fermi-Hubbard, and the like. And they've run experiments with a modest number of qubits with uh, gates that are running in the, the hundreds to uh, up into 5,000 in this particular experiment. So uh, uh, you can do quite experiment, quite complex experiments, and you can get uh, you know, physically useful uh, information about it. And what I like about this is uh, it's the idea that you can do complex enough algorithms now that you're severely testing the quantum algorithms that you're building. And I think this kind of processors we have now really enables the, the algorithm developer community to test realistic algorithms, see how they work and improve it. And you know, you can call this is not exactly the quantum volume metric, it's a quantum volume-ish. It's the number of gates, and we're in the thousands of gates uh, regime right now. So uh, let me, at this point, it's, uh, I think my time is up, or I've gone a little bit over, thank you. Uh, just to say that uh, these complex quantum computers, as we're starting to build things, work as expected at a large Hilbert space. And uh, you know, to make them useful, which is the next thing we want to do, we have to improve the hardware and inventing algorithms. And I would say that these experiments doing the, the, the metrics and doing the benchmarking of these complex devices gives us a lot of information to improve upon that. And finally, this is, I think, very important because it supports a lot of investment in the field, people building bigger and bigger systems because things are working well. And we know that to some degree, the basic physics of these very complex quantum computers are working properly. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And again, thanks for the team at Google, which uh, made this possible by a lot of good teamwork and working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, we have like one or more, one or two minutes for questions. So um, there's some questions in chat. I'll um, process them a little bit and ask. Uh, so. You know, what, 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 what are you, in your opinion, is the kind of the prospects for, for you know, quantum error correction, say using a surface code, um, using this technology? Yes. So the Google um, put on the on archive a, uh, uh, the next generation of surface code. In this case, it was a, a linear chain, but they were able to vastly reduce the errors in the, that linear chain. They also did a, a simple 2D version to show that it worked. And they were able in the 1D chain to both reduce the, the bit and face flip. And they did things like getting rid of two state errors and the like. What's very nice about the paper is they talk about the bench, kind of the benchmarking of it. They talked about what errors contributed and they have a nice budget of the things they have to improve. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, when you look at that, you have to improve measurement, uh, make it faster and make the, the qubits more coherent. But these qubits we're talking about here in these experiments, in, in the experiment I talked about, the, the recent one had, you know, 16 to 20 microsecond T1 coherence times, which is, you know, not at all near the world records. So it's harder because you're building a complex system to get that all working right. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, it still works pretty well. And of course, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a big area of research. And I think if you can get the coherence up to 50 and then to 100 microseconds, then uh, things look pretty good uh, for, for doing what you want to do here. But, you know, you, you know, you have to get both coherence and you don't have to get both gate fidelity and errors down and you have to scale at the same time. Those push against each other, that's very hard. People are working on it. 
and so maybe continuing that question, there's another question about kind of the physical footprint that you do you get when you try to implement something like surface code or you know magic state distillation. Is that something that you know we have enough cooling power to do that? Or? So uh, so the the physical size of the qubits are about one millimeter. And the nice thing about one millimeter, you know, you say that's really big, but you're giving yourself room to bring in wires. So that actually, you can argue whether that's good or bad. I, I think it's actually good because you have the space for the control systems. Uh, the second part of your question was. Right. I mean, I mean, yeah. Oh, well, what's so, the prospect? Yeah. yeah right. when, so, you know, when I, before I left Google, I had gone through these numbers and the Google people have done it itself. Uh, you can convince yourself that the numbers are, are fine for building a big system and scaling up. Uh, and uh, it's not gonna be easy, but when you look at the numbers and think about what's going on, if you're, if you're willing to build, if, if you're willing to envision like a high energy physics experiment, <laughs> okay, and willing to build that kind of thing, maybe not quite as big, but you know, that, that difficulty, then yeah, you can do that. So, you know, I actually feel that it's, uh, you know, there's a pathway to do it. I, I'm sorry that the Google group uh, it, it does not want me talking about some of the details. So all I can say is that the numbers look favorable. Yeah. And, and in, in terms of the uh, of benchmarking, I mean, the benchmarking method you, you uh, presented, you know, it relies on a classical simulation what happens when you try to i mean how would you apply it to a you know much larger system yeah so the cross entropy benchmarking works pretty easily from 2 to 30 and then by the time you get the 40 you need a workstation and 50 you need a, a data center or whatever uh, the nice thing about this is that you can simplify the things and put it in patches or remove some of the gates to do something bigger, and uh, it is possible. But I'm going to say that you know, from this experiment, things are going to go wrong from the two to ten or twenty qubit level. And if you build systems of that size, if you have crosstalk and if you have problems, you'll see it at that size. So this this particular cross entropy benchmarking technique, I think, is is really useful. And then if you want to measure hundreds of qubits you can go ahead and cross entropy benchmarking patches of them, and you can do different benchmarks to, to cover the, the, the cuts. So, you know, you should be able to uh, build up a system. Now there's other ways to benchmark that's good. The nice thing about cross entropy benchmarking is you have very good mathematics that tells you what the error is and, you know, and, and how, that it's very reliable to optimize. So that's why I, uh, I uh, think about it. But uh, um, what I would say is that it's good that people are coming up with a wide variety of benchmarking techniques. This is one of them. I think it's pretty useful and fundamental, but uh, we need a suite, a suite of these and we need to test it in different ways. In fact, running the surface code does its own kind of benchmarking. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's a good way to do it too. Hey, John, uh, I think uh, we're out of time, so... Uh... Thanks a lot for uh, joining us. Um, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, hey, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed uh, the questions.